well. Um, hi, welcome. I feel a little dewy today. It's like over 50 degrees out there, my goodness. Um, well, everyone I'm sure can guess that I'm probably pretty happy about that, so. <laughs> um, yeah, we're uh, gonna spend um, uh, one of our uh, six days in Rhino today. Um, so I have quite a few notes um, for things that I wanna cover today. Uh, we also are in, um, introducing the reality, unreality assignment today. So I'm just gonna tell you real briefly about that. Um, if you uh, have already gotten through, or maybe you're just thinking about the impossible object assignment, the impossible object assignment is designed to be something that is kind of human scale um, and an object, meaning something that you can navigate around as a human or other being. Um, what the reality unreality assignment is really all about is that we're asking you to make an environment that a human could potentially enter. Um, and you know, if you feel really passionately about like non-human rights or whatever, um, I could get a you know we could have a conversation about that. Um, we're just using that as a scale reference. We're not saying that humans are like you know better than everyone else. Um, so yeah. Um, the two sort of major things that are gonna come into this assignment that you have not done in the uh, impossible object assignment is we're going to use materials and we're gonna use lighting. So today, I'm gonna finish up sort of form creation, um, which are all the techniques that would potentially be relevant to both assignments. And then after today, uh, the techniques that we're gonna be looking at are really only needed for the reality unreality assignment, okay? Um, before we begin with that, does anyone have any uh, questions or, or comments? No? Alrighty then. Great. So um, let me double check that everything is going according to plan here. It is. Um, so this is where we left off last class, and I think uh, one of the major things that I want to talk with you about today is and actually, if you would hang on, I'm just gonna pull my notes up on my phone. Uh, I don't know if you all use this, but there is a Canvas app for your phone. Um, yeah, so if you, you know, wanna check on stuff. Um, let's see, you're like, obviously. I use it too, I like it. Although if you're an instructor, you can't do a lot of stuff, but I'm sure if you're a student, it's probably better. So, let me see. Awesome. Uh, so, great. So, uh, one of the major things that I wanna talk with you about today is layers. And so if you look at what we have here, we have uh, sort of some, well, something uh, resembling a boat. It was a little more sensitive than I thought it would be. Um, so first of all, I just sort of like made a really quick move on my, um, per, in my perspective view, and it looks like I basically have like lost the world. Um, so that's one way to, you know, it looks like it's right there, but let's just say hypothetically that I wanted, that I'm kind of lost in rhino space and I wanna, reorient my viewport to get unlost. Um, probably the best way to do that is to select everything in another viewport and then go to the viewport that you're lost in by just clicking up here to make it the active viewport. And then if I go back to my standard tools here, which should have been uh, active in the first place, this is the default, by the way, it's a standard tab. If you click on this tool that has a zoom selected, um, right here, it will sort of uh, both zoom the view to your object, but it will also reset the zero, zero of the orbit coordinates to the average center of the object or set, set of objects. Um, so that can be super, super helpful. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna kind of like move things around just a little bit. And get things sort of where I think they maybe should be. Um, 
so the first thing I'm going to show you is how to use layers. And so it looks like we have uh, here, we have a couple of curves uh, that we used to create this spirally narwhal horn. And then we also have um, a couple of, uh, you know, this boat thing, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put the boat on its own layer. And to do that, I just need to select all the objects. Um, I could also group these. That would probably be a good thing to do, just because there's, what, three or four or five different objects here. There's a couple surfaces. There's the two top surfaces. There's the back surface. There's the thing. And then there's the, the sort of board that sits on the thing. So that's like getting into the realm of like enough things that it seems worthwhile to make a group. So the grouping uh, tool is over here, and I can certainly do that. But an even better way to sort of deal with these, um, when they're grouped, you can deal with them really very similar to a group in Photoshop, where if you select one, you select them all. If you do one thing to one thing, it does it to everything. Um, but another way to sort of get this uh, to be its own thing is to go and use the layers palette. Now, um, this layers panel should be up automatically. If it's not, you can go to the settings wheel and then you can make sure that it's checked. Um, and then obviously you can also pick from all the other panels that we maybe will or won't use. Um, but in this case, we want layers. Now, Rhino sort of pre-populates uh, a certain set of layers with a certain set of colors. You may think that these colors are disgusting, and hey, you, you wouldn't necessarily be wrong. Um, but one of the reasons these colors are actually kind of somewhat useful is because they're highly visible. Um, so if you have multiple objects from different layers, it's really easy to tell the layers apart. Sometimes people will give like a really narrow spectrum of color to all their layers, and it looks cool, but in terms of usability, it's actually not that great because you can't tell which thing is on which layer. So at this point, I'm also this layer color, which I'll show you in just a second what that looks like. The layer color doesn't really appear anywhere outside of this construction view. Um, it, doesn't appear, it doesn't appear in the rendered viewport. It also does not appear in your rendering. So it's really like a preview color. It's not, it's not the same as a material, which we'll get into later. So, since I have these layers already, I'll go ahead and just use one of these pre-existing layers. You can see right now we have the, bla uh, the black layer um, selected, which is also called the default layer. And uh, I'm going to move this whole boat over to the uh, layer one. And so I'm going to use uh, the control key on my keyboard, or I could also double tap to right click. And uh, I should be able to now say, use the change object layer option. You can also copy objects to the layer, which is totally a valid approach, and then delete them from the other layer. I just think it's like nicer and more streamlined to move the objects, because then you don't have to do more than one thing. It's just like a one-stop solution. So you can uh, change the object layer, okay? So, now you can see, wow, we're like, this has all of a sudden just turned into like a death metal boat. Um, and I'm okay with that. Um, as I said before, this um, view, if we look at one of the rendered, uh, like a rendered viewport, for example, um, that, you know, red just completely goes away. So I wouldn't worry about it um, if you don't like it. Now, if you wanted to, let's say, do the impossible object assignment and not use materials or lights, sure, you could come up with like a, an interesting color here, and that would be kind of one way of doing it. It's not a requirement of the assignment. For the impossible object assignment, your assignment can be completely black and white. Um, we're just not asking people to sort of get involved with color. But if you want to, you can. So, okay, so then I've got another sort of like, piece of information that could probably get moved out here. Um, one would be this little thing right here, and then another would be this little thing right here. Now, you might be asking me, like, or asking yourself, well, Meg, you made this crazy narwhal horn, so why do you need these two things uh, um, anymore? Oh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an, uh, 
valid point, I think. Um, the reason that I tend to save stuff like that is because I have been burned so many times. Um, and uh, basically, if you want to make changes to this thing, um, many of the changes that you might need to make, you actually involve reconstructing the, the object, right? So in my sort of experience, it's really helpful to have access to some of those curves that you started with so that you can go back and, you know, remake it if you want to do it differently. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and rename this layer, layer five. I'm going to name it something like uh, construction. And that's usually my sort of like secret code for this is stuff that I made stuff with and it's kind of just random stuff that I want to keep. And then I'll take these two objects and move that over to this layer. So change object layer to over here. Now, you, at this point, probably could potentially ask yourself, well, yeah, but why do you need layers at all? The major benefit to using layers in Rhino is the, and it's really simple, is because you can turn it off and you can get rid of stuff. Um, I don't know that if, if you've noticed, but I mean, for example, like how would we, how would we get into this boat and work on the underside of this thing? Well, it would be really nice if the rest of the boat was not there, but we don't want to delete it. So we could potentially break it up on two layers, get one part out of the way, do what we need to do, and then bring both pieces back. So we'll be doing that type of approach um, with some of our objects. And so I'll go ahead and get rid of the boat for now. Although maybe just for the, a second, it would be helpful to kind of uh, have a, a tiny bit of, uh, have it around for a tiny bit of scale reference. So the, um, the assignment reality unreality call, calls for you to make an environment. I am going to make the simplest type of environment that we can make, which is literally a box, right? Like a room. Um, can you make your environment much more complicated? Sure, go for it. Um, you could actually, if you wanted to be like a Lilliputian, you could make this boat your environment. Um, if maybe other things inside it were really small, right? Um, but for, just because I, of kind of um, the way that this assignment is structured and also the way that the tools work, I feel like uh, using something simple like a box is, is beneficial. So I can go ahead and start with a box. Um, so we already have this um, solid primitive called box. And we could make it uh, corner to corner with the height. That tends to be my preferred method. Um, you'll want your environment, by the way, to be quite a bit larger than your object. Um, and the reason for that is a couple of reasons. One, uh, because the light if you're using light, uh, the light does need some amount of room. Um, and then the other reason is that the camera needs a certain amount of room. And the camera being, you know, this thing that is controlling the two-dimensional display of our object, right? So um, don't panic. We, uh, now you can see we're kind of like outside um, the box. And obviously, this box, it still needs a little work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create what's called a cutaway view. That's a convention that is used in architectural rendering and other sort of product rendering where you create a box that only has a certain number of walls. Why? Because let's say you want to keep the camera back here and you don't want it to be blocked by walls. That is why we make cutaway views. Um, so in order to make this cutaway view, uh, I first of all have to kind of break up my box. My box is a poly surface right now. It's, um, it's a solid. If I deleted it, it would delete the entire thing. But I think you might remember we talked a tiny bit about the explode object. So the explode object, or the explode function rather, will take this box and it will break it up into six, six uh, surfaces. I hope it's six because, you know, it would be weird if it weren't. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and just try that out. And now you can see we have six distinct surfaces. 
Now, which, um, which of these surfaces do you choose to delete and which do you choose to leave? Um, this is totally up to you. Um, I actually made like kind of an advanced uh, option of this a couple of years ago where we decided to like uh, make a donut and have our environment actually be a donut. Um, and I, yeah, <laughs> like the inside of a donut. <laughs> um, and, and that, you know, it's just a little, tr it's tricky because of, you have to, ha as I said before, you have to have room for the lights, you have to have room for the camera. We had to actually end up just slicing it in half, but it looked like it was an entire donut. Um, so yeah, like feel free to experiment with all of this stuff. It's, there are no rules. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead, I think, and get rid of this top surface and these two. And so this is usually referred to as a three-quarter cut cutaway. Um, so yeah, it's a it's pretty common convention. Now, you may have noticed one thing is that this box that I made, or maybe we could call it a gallery, is um, it looks like it's intersecting with my boat, and that's probably less than ideal. So that's not a huge problem. I could just come into any view, uh, like the right or the front view, and I could probably just drag this up um, if I have the right object snaps uh, in play. And then, uh, you know, I can also just kind of place it wherever I want later. And it also looks like right now the front of the boat is facing the back of the gallery, which just doesn't really make a lot of sense. So maybe now would be a good time to review the rotation uh, uh, function. So if you go to rotate up here, and again, we can rotate now the entire object because it's a group. So you can go to the center of rotation and this center, I would definitely just um, guesstimate. Um, rotating it from the, this point that's at the bottom would be probably extra good because then when we go over here, we can definitely snap to a point on the bottom. And then we can just flip it over. And no harm done. So, now that I'm actually kind of thinking about this a little bit more, um, I probably want it at a slight angle, so it's angled towards the center. Um, and we may also decide to scale it up. Um, you may notice that my environment, my box, looks quite a bit bigger than my boat. And so like, if this were a shoe box, this boat would be like, too big. But um, really that can also be kind of taken care of with the camera, so once you get uh, sort of zoomed in on certain objects, you don't really have, and you lose that scale reference to the outside perimeter, you don't have any way, you know, you don't have any visual cues to tell you how big this thing is. I usually make the box bigger than it needs to be so that I have some play and that I can move back and forth and really move the camera around and still have it covered, you know, with walls. Sometimes I even move the camera where I like it and then I'm like, oh man, this bottom surface is not big enough. You can scale it to fit, right? So no big deal, it's all very malleable. Um, so that being said, I think we had talked about uh, layers, so probably a really good thing to do right now is to take these three shapes and to go ahead and put them on their own layer. So I think I'm gonna use this purple layer and I'm just gonna call this room. And then I'm going to uh, change that object layer. And by the way, while I'm here, I'm also gonna take layer one and I think I'm gonna rename it boat. Um, I'm a huge fan of layer names. Uh, no matter what the software uh, you're using is, I'm just gonna nudge this up a tiny bit. Um, and the reason that I, whoops, um, the reason that I use layer names uh, a lot is because I, you know, I have the brain of a goldfish, in case you haven't noticed. So like, it's nice to just like have stuff, not have to worry about it or not have to think about it, it's there. It says it's a boat, it's a boat. <laughs> so, um, in any case, I just um, wanted to nudge this like straight up. I'm happy with the XY position of it. Um, in the top view, but I want it to go straight up. So this is just like all kind of a tiny refresher. You'll notice that when I bump, bump it up and it uses the object snap that it bumps to the edge of the floor. 
So I can disable my object snap and put it in ortho mode, and that will constrain it to basically go straight up, um, which in this case is what we want. So I'm gonna turn ortho off because I'm pretty sure that the next thing that I'm gonna work on is uh, basically, let me make sure I'm keeping track with time here. Okay. Um, the next thing that I wanna do is to uh, basically make like these sort of like big bat wing, maybe not bat wings, maybe more like insect wings um, for this boat because it doesn't look messed up enough yet um, for me to be really happy with it. So um, let's see. Definitely I would want to get rid of the room, we're calling it, and that allows me to sort of isolate the boat um, and that can be helpful for several reasons. I think for right at this very second, I will work in the top and front view the most. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a control point curve. And I think I'm gonna use some point on this, this curve or this surface. Um, I'm also gonna just real quickly kind of zoom in here so I can have a little bit of a better view of, of what's going on here. And I'm gonna do that in all four of my viewports. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create these sort of wuxi curves. Wuxi is a highly, highly important technical term. Um, now, one thing that I'm a little unhappy with is that because I'm in ortho mode, it's kind of you know, constraining what I can do. So I'm gonna take it out of ortho mode so I can get an even wuxier curve. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter there. Now you may notice that one of these curve points it looks like is not planar. Well, that's because I forgot to hit the planar uh, constraint button. It's no big deal, um, I can make it planar. So all I have to do is um, hit the shift key. Fun fact, if you hit the shift key, it will automatically enable ortho. Um, and for the, what I'm gonna do with these, it, it doesn't really matter if they're planar anyway, I just didn't want it to be like, <laughs> like way not planar. Um, but having these be slightly not planar is fine. So I think what I'm gonna do uh, pretty quickly here is I'm gonna take one of these points, I'm gonna move it up, and then I'm gonna take one of these points and maybe move it a bit down or maybe also move it up. Um, I'm basically just kind of moving these up and down until I feel like they look right. So that looks pretty nice. It looks kind of like elegant, you know, from the side. Um, don't worry too much about how it looks in the right view because that's just looking at it like straight on. Um, but yeah, this looks like it could totally get, we could get somewhere with this. Um, so now I'm gonna go ahead and make another one of these. And maybe I'll start over here. And I think I'm gonna take the curve forward a little bit. I think I am just gonna keep it planar um, to start with because it gives me a good sort of like baseline of reference. Oh, that just looks weird. Um, so you can see I kind of like misfired on that a little bit maybe, um, but you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna get to the point where I can sort of uh, close, or close the curve and I'm just gonna go in and I'm gonna edit these points. And I think I'm gonna take both of these points and move them up quite a bit. And now this is getting, getting somewhere. Okay, so where do I go from here? Well, this would be probably a fantastic time to use the edge curves function. Um, you might be asking yourself, well, what's gonna happen to this part? Um, we could leave that straight or we could create maybe another curve that sort of um, goes bridges the distance between the two and just kind of caps it in a way that is like a little bit, 
like that. Um, I think that looks fine for me. So I'm gonna go up here to surface and do that edge curves thing. And it says select two, three, or four open curves. So should be able to, it may or may not like this poly surface edge, but I'm gonna give it a shot. It did, yay. Um, so that's basically what our sort of like winged surface looks like right now. Now, okay, so we've already done that. That's kind of a review. This time we're gonna do something like a tiny bit different. I'm gonna take this, this we'll get into when we do um, materials uh, on Wednesday, but what I would really like to have for this sort of wing, and there'll be one more too, is that I think it would be really awesome if this wing could have like a lattice structure that kind of conforms to the surface and that then the surface could be like paper thin, you know, almost like, like, a, like an insect wing, right? Where it's kind of translucent, see-through. So basically, I'm getting into the realm of making things with other things, which, by the way, Rhino is really good at that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a bunch of curves that are gonna conform to the surface, and then we'll take like a, um, a pipe or a tube and we'll basically take each of those curves and we're gonna create a pipe around them or a tube around them. And it will look like it has some sort of lattice structure, okay? So notice that also that I'm not sort of cutting and pasting this, this wing thing um, until this is totally done because I wanna basically completely develop one and then pop it over to the other side for, to have two. Also, they don't have to both be the same, but just because we have you know, constrained time, allow me the indulgence. Um, so here in the curve menu, you'll see that there's a lot of uh, stuff under curve from objects. And one of the things that you can do is you can create UV curves, um, and we will probably do that. So, uh, okay, hang on, not that. Um, let's go ahead and try the extract ISO curve. And so then uh, we're, ah oh yeah, this is it, sorry. Um, so it's a select ISO curve to extract. Um, every fun every three-dimensional object has a totally different set of coordinates that you probably will never need to know about again in your life unless you're doing uh, a lot of 3D animation. Um, but they're called UV coordinates, and they're basically uh, sort of like coordinates that let you know which direction light is coming from. And so one is in one direction, one is horizontal, and one is vertical. So it will let you basically create these conforming curves on one axis, right? So this was the U. And then if I switch over to the V axis, now you can see it's operating in a whole other way. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and create one for the middle part here, even because this is not actually a curve, it's a part of the surface. Okay, so I'm done. Um, so now I can take these curves along with probably my edge curves and if I go over here to the solid uh, primitive menu, you can see there's a, a section for pipe with flat caps. And so it's asking me to come up with a pipe radius. So I wanna just double check my units real quickly. I'm pretty sure that one of these tiny boxes is one. And uh, looking at the bottom right of the section, it looks like yes, x equals one. Okay, so a pipe radius of one, uh, I don't know, maybe we'll go for two just to make it visible, to make it extra visible. And uh, in this case, you have an option to put a cap on it. So if you were doing a bunch of these that were not intersecting at the ends, 
the cap would matter a lot. In this case, it hardly matters at all because they're gonna be intersecting. Um, but you can choose between like a flat and a round cap. Oh, that might be a bit too big actually. Um, but anyway, you get the idea. I'm gonna go ahead and control Z this and I'm gonna do it with a slightly smaller uh, scale. Um, Another really great shortcut in Rhino, it, did you, did, has anyone told you, uh, maybe the TAs have told you this already, that if you hit the enter key at any point, it'll just bring up the last command. Oh. So you don't have to like go find it uh, again. So if you're doing repetitive work, it's super, super helpful. Um, I'm gonna just t take this down to one, uh, cause we sort of, there we go. That looks a little less ridiculous. Um, okay, so yeah. So now at some point, um, you'll see, if I go ahead and just show you what this looks like in the rendered viewport, we're gonna be looking at the rendered viewport a lot more. Um, you can see that this, uh, both, uh, everything on the screen is opaque, right? But in the, uh, on Wednesday, we'll be able to take these panes or this sort of surface and we can assign the surface uh, different transparent characteristics, transparent materials, and we can, you know, this, the rest of the boat I'm pretty sure is gonna be wood, and then I was thinking that this would be like flaming gold. Um, <laughs> we'll see. Um, so that's kind of my secret plan. Um, but for now, I think I could probably just take this thing that I'll call a wing and uh, select as much of it as I can, uh, select the entire thing actually, and just mirror it to copy it over to the other side of the boat. So, uh, I'm gonna make, uh, I guess I'll put the wings on layer three. And probably I might take the opportunity to show you this, which is you can make sublayers in Rhino. So I just took the wings layer and I dragged it into the boat layer. Um, that can be super, super useful. Um, so you cannot nest layers in Rhino more than one, as far as I know. Um, I've never tried it. And so here I would just uh, change these objects into the wings layer. And now I still need to take this one and mirror it. But look, I'm just absolutely like a wreck today. I have to tell you a personal story. My cat ran up a tree last night and yeah, I thought we were gonna have to call the fire department. I was up until like two o'clock in the morning and he wouldn't even talk to me this morning. He was so tired, it was so sad. So anyway, <laughs> um, the, uh, now, I forgot to select this, but it's still sort of like all broken up, right? So another, this is actually good because I can show you how to, uh, from any layer, you can go to uh, where it says uh, this sort of menu that you get when you double click, and you can go to select objects, and you can use the layer to uh, actually control your selection. I don't know if y'all have noticed this. You probably noticed it in the modules project. Um, selecting a bunch of stuff in Rhino can be super tedious. And so using layers is one really great way to like kind of turbocharge that. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and take the opportunity to group these just so I don't forget later. Um, and it's easy enough to ungroup stuff. So I, I do tend to like work in, you know, with stuff in groups. Um, but here, I'm gonna go to transform, mirror, do, do, and just pop it over to the other side. And now we have our flying boat. So I wanna show you one more thing today. Um, it will take a few minutes to kind of run through it, um, but we've got time, so that's good. I'm gonna make sure all of my layers are up right now. So a couple of you have asked me about creating organic form. And I guess I would argue that kind of depends on what you mean as organic, um, because, you know, like the narwhal horn is a type of organic, but it's definitely like repetitive organic, right? 
If you want to create organic form that doesn't have that sort of rep repetitive vibe, um, you can certainly do what's called cage editing. Um, and so I'm going to bring up uh, a sphere. Just going to create a regular old sphere. And I probably will stick it in the front here. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the other objects in the scene. Um, well, not get rid of them, but you know, make them invisible. Um, because uh, you know, when I'm modeling in general, oh, by the way, this little spare curve could totally go here under my construction curves. Um, this, um, you know, when I'm modeling like single objects in general, I really try uh, to kind of isolate them as much as I can. So, um, yeah. So let's go ahead and get started with this sphere. So we're about to do uh, a method of modeling that's called cage editing. And most 3D modelers support what is known as cage editing. Um, it's also sometimes called puppet modeling. Um, but uh, in Rhino, it's called cage editing. So if we go over to the transform menu and we select cage editing, there's a two-part process. So first, you would go about creating a cage. So by the way, we're using, uh, we're using the, um, a sphere just as a sort of example, but you should be able to cage edit pretty much any object in Rhino. Um, so it asks you to sort of draw a box around the object. If you don't get the object all the way around the box, don't worry, you can move it into the box. Now, over here where it says cage parameters, you might want to take a look. Um, I'll leave it up on the screen for a second. You might want to take a look at the parameters that I've selected. The, the ones that Rhino kind of auto-populates in there, I think, frankly, I think are a bit much. They ask, so for each part of the box, each face of the box, they ask to have a 10 by 10 in, uh, grid. That's like a crazy amount of points, and it's just a lot to keep track of. So I usually go for a much lower point count. Um, it just kind of depends on what you're trying to do. But um, anyway, so I, for the XYZ, I have four points, and then for the um, degrees, I have three degrees. So then it makes your cage, and you know, from here, you're probably like, wow, that's like the most underwhelming thing Meg has ever shown us. Um, but no, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> the next step is that you actually use the cage to edit. So um, we can come in here to transform cage editing, and then it's right here, um, cage edit. So select the cage edit option, and then it asks you to select captive objects. I have to tell you, the objects that you select really should be inside this box. <laughs> That's sort of how it works. Um, so just FYI. Um, if the box is not in the right place relative to the object that you want to edit, you can actually move the box to make sure that it, it encompasses the object. Okay? So then you can hit enter, and then you're as it's asking you, okay, select control object. The control object in this case is the box. And then uh, region to edit. I usually just hit enter there. And now you can see we are sort of officially cooking with gas. So, which I hear is frowned upon in some circles. Um, so my sort of strategy with this is to take, uh, you know, multiple points at once. So I just um, use the shift key and kind of am moving these points through. Um, and you can see it's sort of slowly, slowly deforming that object. Um, and so, it's pretty tedious. It's not without its problems, maybe. Um, but you can get really interesting and weird results. And if you're looking for a sort of like smooth, um, you know, biomorphic form that you probably couldn't make very easily using traditional surface creation methods in Rhino, um, this is for you. 
So I'm sure you can imagine just by looking at this, it still seems like kind of a lot of cage points. Um, you know, using um, a 10 by 10 grid, I just don't know how, I don't know how you would even do that. Like it just seems like way too much to me. Um, and of course you can also, you know, kind of mess with this in perspective. So there it is, one, a single pebble. Um, and probably, I guess, I would maybe just make a big move here and just take a bunch of these um, curve points and just squish the whole thing down. Yeah. All righty. So now you may think, like, okay, well, these... Um, these cage points are still on, uh, you can come up here to the menu over here and you can just say points off. Um, and then this control object, you could keep it, but if you don't want it sticking around, you could certainly move it to the uh, construction layer uh, that we already made. And so there is your squishy, squishy pebble. Um, it takes, I've done some actual like sort of things that I care about with cage editing, and it, it does take, it takes a little time, you know, um, because you have to really sort of think about the shape and the form of the object. Um, but especially if you're doing things maybe with the bend method or with the twist method, and it's just not getting the result you want, the cage method is very, as you can tell, is very specific. Um, so it's just a different way of doing things. So let's bring up the room and this weird pebble thing. I think I'll keep this in the mix here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and scale it down. And so uh, we've talked a little bit about scaling. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just do a really informal scale on this. Um, so it just um, honked at me because it was like, hey, you had me in a cage, and guess what? Cage doesn't fit anymore because I'm in a different spot, and that's totally fine. I don't care. <laughs> um, but for now, I think I could probably like just pop this up um, and let it live with the other thing. I think I might rotate it also to just get a little bit flatter on the thing. Um, so one thing that uh, people ask me about a lot is like uh, when you're rotating um, with the sort of standard um, toolkit, the sort of 2D rotate, um, you're really uh, taking, oh, let's put it there. Um, and I think I'm gonna take the entire boat actually so I can select objects. And that will also, uh, I'll have to select the sublayer as well. So I think I want to just drag this a little bit further back in the space. Um, so it's doing that annoying thing where I totally didn't disable my object snaps. And let me just pop this up a tiny bit. Ow. Busy. Sorry, y'all. Let me turn my ringer off. That's what I get for turning my phone on. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to disable these and then just pop this back um, so it's not sort of like magnetizing to the, to the room object. Um, so this is all fine. I'll probably get, just give this like some kind of like rock texture or something like that um, just to kind of create some variation in the room. Um, we also have, uh, I'll make probably one more object tomorrow. So, uh, and by tomorrow I mean Wednesday, it's that object permanence thing. Um, so on Wednesday, we're going to really almost exclusively uh, look at lighting and using lighting. And so I will make a, one or two objects that are gonna function as light objects, okay? So, hey, have a wonderful couple of days.